This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning John Rubino well-known author and publisher of the website dollarcollapse.com. Good morning, John, and welcome back to Macroanalytics. Uh, good morning, Gordon. Thanks for having me on. Well, we missed last month, so I'm looking forward to another one of our sessions. John, I probably need to reintroduce you because we've had so many new listeners that have been joining us since we started circulating these on, uh, on YouTube. The reason that um, I asked John to join us uh, in macro analytics in 2012 if for a number of reasons, but when John has a, a, a very firm grasp of the issues with the U.S. dollar and the, the emergence of uh, currency wars that we've been witnessing here for at least two years, I, I'm going to call you an expert, and I don't know if that's a kiss of death or not. <laughs> also, his writing uh, touches on a number of our 2012 themes identified in our 2000. 12 thesis paper financial repression shown here on the on the screen and three john's website a dollarcollapse.com identifies on a daily basis important articles on the web in a manner that allows you to focus on what's important his site has a, has categories that overlap surprisingly well with emerging central issues our research is uh, presently highlighting here in 2012 the, the roadmap you see on your screen now is identifying financial repression, as I said, that our thesis 2012 report, uh, which is free on our site at gordontlong.com. It shows financial repression is just another step in contributing in the roadway to a potential fiat currency failure. Um, I also show here the roadmap John and I hope to explore during the upcoming sessions. It links well to the sessions we've had with Charles Hugh Smith and Ty Andrews, who really pick it up from the central planning end of it up to uh, to what we call statism. Any comments on this uh, this roadmap we're showing here on the screen, John? The, the original idea or the original hope uh, for globalization was that uh, as we free up trade between various countries, we would get a general freeing of the global economy. In other words, lowering trade barriers would lead to a harmonization of policies uh, centered around um, freedom, low taxes, minimal regulation, um, a greater and freer flow of capital and labor around the world, and, and we'd get kind of the capitalist ideal on a global basis. But what has happened instead is that uh, because various countries have pursued really different policies. We've ended up with some some imbalances with uh, some countries having uh, accumulated massive uh, trade deficits and huge debts and others accumulating uh, big foreign exchange balances. And, and because of that, we're, we're seeing a, a series of rolling crises around the world, which is leading to governments feeling like they're forced to take a greater role in uh, in regulation and management of trade and, and management of their, their local economies. And so we're actually getting more authoritarian due to globalization. And that in turn is leading to kind of a partnership between corporations and central banks and governments um, so that we're, we're heading instead of a, a, a freer, more um, capitalist world, we're heading for something that uh, that looks like fascism <laughs> down the road where, where we've got governments controlling more and more of um, uh, of the economic and social lives of people around the world and each new crisis leads to um, a, an increase in government intervention so we're, we're heading as, as the chart indicates towards some kind of a totalitarian state and away from a global free market economy and that's that's unfortunate but it's also reversible if we catch it in time. And that's, that's basically uh, where we are today. You know, we're heading in this direction, but uh, enough people are picking up on it that uh, the debate gets very interesting from here on out because um, what, what's going to happen in the very near future is, is absolutely crucial to the, the future 
of humanity. Very well said. Very nice description. I don't think this should be any surprise that this would be a natural evolution. As our forefathers often warned us, you know, democracy is hard won and easily lost. And, and in the systems, you have to continuously be on guard. And therefore, we have to be very cognizant of being able to police and stop these things from happening. And And, you know, the word fascism is an ugly word. But when Mussolini coined that word, he, he was very positive with it, and he was describing it as the economic marriage of government with corporations for the benefit of the, of the people. And those sounded like very, very good words, but we all know what came out of it. John, we've had a lot of discussions with Charles and, and, and Ty on crony capitalism and the degree that which it has now evolved in a lot of the governments and more so than anywhere that is in the, here in the United, United States. But again, it's also a natural consequence of when you get more and more central government and you get it because there's more and more competition in this, um, this global, global environment. Comments on that? It's really important to understand when we're looking at the U.S. in particular that uh, the Federal Reserve and the, uh, the, the central government and the, the major corporations, especially the, the military industrial complex corporations, but also the, in general, our, our big exporting companies are really part of the same organization. You know, they're, they're divisions in a, a single entity. And so they're not competitors and there there's no balance of power with uh, you know countervailing powers here and there um keeping everybody honest it, it's all one big organization right now with a single goal which is the accumulation of more power and like you said that that's that's an inevitable result of the um the structures that we put in place and and central among those structures is uh fiat currency if you give the government a printing press uh, you inevitably lead to um, distortions in, in what might have been a free market at the time because governments will always abuse the ability to create new new cash in order to get reelected and they'll they'll hand that newly created money to banks, which then become incredibly powerful and kind of either take over the government or merge with the government. And you get basically what we have right now, a system where there are um, – so, some very powerful moneyed interests that, that feed off of the, the new cash that is created by the central bank in ever increasing quantities and, and basically, um, extinguish the, the freedom of individuals that, uh, that we thought we, um, had achieved with the constitution. And uh, that's where we are now with, uh, basically a big monolithic government that has control of a printing press and therefore has control over everything that goes on within the U.S. John, I think that for our listeners who hear all the time about global imbalances, I think what what would be important here to do is really to describe what are the global imbalances out there? What I mean, what are they that are causing the, the problems? We hear about trade imbalances, current account deficits, balance of payments. What, 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 what are the major imbalances that you see? Well, right now we've got some countries like China and uh, other parts of Asia and some of the oil exporting countries that have built up massive um, – foreign exchange balances, mostly denominated in dollars. And so they basically have, in effect, invested in dollars on a really massive scale. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the importing countries who have decided to live, live well by borrowing as much as possible, uh, like the U.S. and the U.K. And, and some of the peripheral European countries who now owe incredible amounts of money. And Japan, by the way. Japan is sort of a hybrid. They owe a huge amount of money, and they, they're also an exporting powerhouse. Sorry to interrupt. I would say oh, sure. were. They've now got a negative trade balance yeah, for the very first fine. time. And, uh, you know, they are, uh, without question, you're right, they're an, an export powerhouse. But it's an example of these balances are changing. Imbalances can only grow to a certain point. You know, they, they can't go to infinity. No, Preci no trend can. Precisely. And we're at the point now where uh, this might be getting a little bit ahead of the story, but where, where these imbalances have to be reversed out because they've grown um, to the point where they're completely unsustainable. So, for instance, China with, what, $1.5 trillion worth of um, treasury bonds and other U.S. bonds. That's American – uh, treasuries, uh, three, yeah. it's actually three trillion in total, total uh, reserves of all, of all mm -hmm. denominations and values. Yeah. And, and so this is in, in effect, it's an investment in U.S. dollars and euros now to, to a, an increasing extent. And 
it's a really bad investment. You know, they're, they're realizing that they have given us a bunch of stuff in return for currencies that are not going to be worth nearly as much as they were when they got them. And so they're trying to figure out what to do about this. And there are, there are a limited number of options in the short run because they can't just sell all their treasury bonds because that would crash the market and um, hurt them more than it helps them. And so they're stuck with this, this balance of depreciating assets, this very bad investment that um, should it go down dramatically from here will hurt them dramatically because this is a big part of the Chinese economy. You know, that the, they owe or they, they own treasuries equal to nearly their GDP. And so for that to turn out to be an investment that, that goes down by 50% or whatever is a huge hit. And they know that. And uh, so they've got this big problem. You know, it's the old story. If you, uh, if you owe the bank a hundred dollars, it's your problem. If you owe the bank a million dollars, it's their problem. Well, um, it's China's problem now. You know, our, the U.S. Um, deficit and debt and uh, resulting policy of depreciating the dollar is China's problem. And so um, what looked like a great deal for them, you know, selling us stuff in return for treasury bonds is turning out to be a very bad deal. And I, don't, I don't think it came as it's any surprise to China. They knew where it was going, and but it was their way of uh, politically – finding work for 1.2 billion people who were, you know, with 50 million leaving the rice paddies and, and coming to the cities. They, they had to do something significant with the, uh, with the Chinese um, uh, post-communist era. And they, and they learned their lessons from the other Asian tigers of what, what made Japan and, and, and Taiwan and, and South Korea so successfully. And that, it, and that's, you know, it reminds me uh John, when I was a young man, we had something called a layaway plan if I bought a suit. You know, credit was a little bit more expensive back then. And the store owner knew you didn't have any money, but he was willing to give you the suit if he knew he was going to get the credit. And he, and he gave you and you put it away, layaway, and you paid so much and you got your suit. What China did is effectively that. And so what they've done is, and maybe our listeners need to fully understand as a strategy, so they would, they would get the money from us for paying the goods or at least the, the debt claim on it. They would take the cash, and the first thing they did is they immediately buy U.S. Treasuries with it. And the reason they buy the U.S. Treasuries is it does a, does a number of things. It drives in, Treasury prices up, but it drives interest rates down. And when interest rates go down, all of a sudden it's much easier for you to buy more suits. So suddenly their products were easily funded and people had more wealth to, to create the credit. Additionally, what it did is it weakened their, kept their currencies down, kept the United States dollar up, which meant you, the consumer could buy more goods. And we've steadily climbed to having a, a U.S. Uh, consumption of economy of 70% consumption. So, but, but meanwhile, China's had an unbelievably positive growth and have ended up with this $3 trillion in, in, um, in reserve ba uh, bank balance reserves, so our currency reserves rather. So they they knew it was only a matter like my store owner before he knew that possibly I was never ever going to be able to afford the suit. Now they're trying to shift and try and figure out, how, as you correctly point, what they're going to do with the with the money, and that's a tremendous a tremendous problem now in front of them. So John, what what you're saying in global imbalances. The key imbalance right now, you believe, is is the global reserve currencies that are just miscued, and they represent uh, many other kinds of imbalances from trade right through current accounts and balance payments. Everything right now depends on the value of the dollar and the euro. Mm -hmm. As long as those currencies hold their value, this game can go on, and uh, and people can keep on doing what they've been doing. We can keep on borrowing as long as people like the idea of owning more treasury bonds. Um, the exporting countries like China can keep on exporting as long as they're getting a currency that has some value in return for their stuff. So let the value of the dollar and the euro start to, to fall dramatically, which, you know, the imbalances out there kind of point to that at some point, then, then the game is over. And these strategies no longer work, and everything falls apart. So this is and why the United States has to be a proponent of a strong dollar policy. At least well, this is the like, mantra that comes out of out of. Yeah, yeah, they, they have to say that. But there, there's a limit to how long you can fool people. So it's and, a matter that tell the Chinese we have a strong dollar policy. Meanwhile, you're devaluating the currency to get out from under the debt. 
Yeah. Oh, the Chinese understand this game. Like you said, they, they know what's going on. Of course they, they do. They, they knew it from the beginning and they understand it now. And it's been worth it to them yes, to play the game. Ex- exactly. But a, a lot of the rest of the world hasn't yet figured out that it's a scam. And so there are still people out there buying treasury bonds thinking that's a safe haven. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's like putting your money in cash which will be worth the same next year as the the year before. And that's not the case. At some point, um, the the sheer volume of, uh, of dollar credit that's out there is going to blow up one way or another. Either the dollar plunges in value or that credit evaporates through default. And one way or the other, holding dollar-denominated debt turns out to be a really, really bad investment. And so... Knowing it's coming, um, you know, should tell you to avoid that kind of an investment. But because a lot of other things look even worse right now, the, the dollar is getting this global demand that is really, um, it, it's illusory. You know, it's a, it's a bad idea to be investing in dollars, but putting your money anywhere else in, in the eyes of a lot of investors is even worse. Um, so we're, we're at that kind of, um, we're at a tipping point, but it's not clear whether the, the, the change comes this year or next year or the year later, but it, it's coming for sure because the imbalances are just so great right now. Ty Andrews, a uh, regular on, on the show here, he never refers to them as bonds. He calls them bombs. And he says, you're, so you, he says, I won't buy treasury bombs. And it, because he really does believe that it's just a matter of time when they're going to blow up. Yeah. And that he argues that, you know, currencies are all falling. They just fall at different rates. Mm-hmm. And uh, right now, the, the you know, the, the U.S. dollar just happens to be the one that's perceived to have the flight to safety, which is a uh, is a timing issue. It currently is yeah. as of today, but um, will probably be the last to fall. Uh, but, we, but when it comes, it'll be rather uh, rather abrupt. So, John, wh- why do we have these um, tremendous imbalances? What, what's the bottom line on that one? Well, we have the imbalances because uh, different countries chose different strategies um, 15 or 20 years ago for their development or, or more accurately for their the government's re-election. You know, China and a lot of the, uh, the other exporting countries decided to um, try to build up export related industries internally as a way of giving their people jobs and to sell stuff to the rest of the world and uh, you know in the process accumulate a lot of of foreign currency and um, the US the UK and the peripheral eurozone countries um decided consciously or or not to use their currencies to borrow a lot of money and buy stuff and in that way, build up a lot of debt and, and uh, build up a lot of claims on their own future economic production because so much of their currency is out in the world and, and uh, you know, can be traded for domestically produced stuff at some point in the future. And so they build up huge amounts of debt and obligations to the rest of the world. At each step in the process or each election cycle, this looked like a good idea because it kept people working or it, it, it kept them um, being able to buy really nice stuff, which made them feel rich. And so they were more likely to vote for incumbents. But, um, you know, as we've talked about, both both sides of the equation are becoming unsustainable. You know, this could only go along, go only go on for a couple of decades. And we're at the end of those two decades now. So, um Something that can't go on forever won't go on forever. And we're at the point now where at, at some point this has to blow up at some point soon. And so everybody's feeling the strain and we're having crisis after crisis and choosing short-term fix after short-term fix in order to keep the game going for as long as possible. And so, the, the, you know, the question just comes down to when it blows up and uh, what is the catalyst? You know, you and I have written on this subject you know, quite extensively here for a few years now, you know, and I was thinking of uh, recently, you know, and, 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 and I'm always grappling with solutions for this and the degree of the problem. And one of the things I watch very closely, John, is the Bank of International Settlement in, ba- in Basel with a central bank to the central banks around around the world and the research and the, their, their thinking. And they recently had a a major paper out that isolated in their mind the specific drivers 
of the global imbalances. And I, and I, and I thought it's really telling to listen to them as they're looking at, therefore, what the solutions are, whether they're right or wrong, because, you know, they actually had a one week conference and brought the best minds in the world in as they tore it down. But what, what they isolated as the specific drivers of this were, were two full one, and I don't think there's any surprise to anybody, regional growth differentials that we can see, and then the capacity to generate financial assets from real investments, which is an interesting and a very telling way of really describing a lot of our problems. And I could get into a whole discussion on Europe right now on, on, on that. But that from that, then they said that in turn, uh, th these were causing the, 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 the key effects of one, U.S. currency account deficit, declining long-term real rates as that we're seeing with the treasuries and a rise in the share of U.S. assets in global portfolios. And we get into the whole discussion of glow, of collateral contagion that's going on as there's becoming fewer and fewer viable assets. And especially if these portfolios are in the, are U.S. assets in their portfolios that are denominated in U.S. dollars. And this, and this in turn, they argued and proved very, very analytically from a lot of the research papers, this in turn was then resulting in the more visible trade imbalances, current account deficits, and, uh, and balance of payment issues that we're seeing. Comments on, on any of that? Due to the length of this discussion, we have segmented into two parts. The second part will continue, part two. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.